So I wanted to make this series in response to a lot of the conversations I've been having when I play basketball with people. Inevitably, our conversations lead in the direction of, I used to be able to play all day, now I play one or two games and my feet, my ankles, my knees, my hips, my back, sometimes even shoulder, some combination of all six of those things, um, they just hurt now. And I have to take maybe three or four days off from like playing basketball and then eventually things kind of settle down and I might be able to go again maybe for one or two games. And they tell me about their stretching routines and then and they're like, I'm still in pain. Um, they tell me about their strength training routines and you know, some people mention that it kind of helps but they still only last maybe one or two games. And what they quickly realize in having a conversation with me is that it's not that they're not working hard at trying to resolve the issue, but they just haven't found the right thing to work hard at. And so hopefully in this series, we might be able to shed some light as to why you're in pain, why things are bothering you, and how we can get you back on court and doing something that you love and kind of off of the prehab, rehab type of exercises that you might find everywhere. So the first thing I want to look at are feet and ankles. Uh, which are often a very touchy thing with a lot of basketball players in that they probably sprain their ankles more times than they can remember. And this often leads to a lot of instability at the feet. And it's probably one of the main causes for everything upstream in regards to our knee or our hip or even our back as to why it's bothering us. So um, one of the big pieces of advice I have to give players is kind of get away from all the heavy bracing and taping and high tops in particular and try to go with more a mid or even a low top type sneaker. Um, I know that Kobe Bryant really revolutionized this with like his more mid to low type of uh, sneaker. Um, and that a lot, he drew a lot of inspiration from soccer players and that you know they were able to wear cleats with low tops and not really suffer as many ankle sprains as basketball players. Um, and a lot of that is due to the fact that you know basketball sneakers tend to be very cushioned um, because of the high top, it tends to kind of lock the ankle in, so you lose a lot of the natural motions that occur. Um, so that's just that little spiel. Uh, but so now, looking at the feet, right? Starting with the toes, uh, one of the first things I look at is, can you move your toes well? Right, so if I tell you lift all your toes up, I mean, one thing I might notice is if you can't do this, then maybe the bottom of your feet are a little bit uh, overly taut. Um, and so the plantar fascia might be limiting the ability to extend the toes. Um, after that, I want to see, can you independently move your toes? So I would say big toe down and back up without letting the other four move. And then try to switch, keep the big toe up, touch the floor with the other four and back up. And so this will give you a good barometer as to how your feet are functioning, or at least your toes, right? And see, can you do this, right? And maybe even alternate, this gives you a good indication how your toes are moving and by proxy your feet. Talking about the feet and particularly the ankle, one other thing I want to see in a lot of my um, basketball players, soccer players is can they maintain good contact through the floor and be able to roll the foot in and out? And so what I mean by that is, so if I think about maintaining contact through all the toes, the ball, the foot, and the heel, can I collapse the inside so roll it to the inside and then roll it back out without losing this contact point. So I don't want to see my foot roll completely off. So in and out. So what this is telling me is that does the rear of my foot move in opposition to the front? Um, the best example I could give you, so if this hand is the front of your foot and this is the back, as my foot stays planted, the front, right? the heel has to be able to rotate counter to the front, right? So it's always going essentially in opposite directions. Um, so you wanna assess both feet and kinda of see, can you get there? And it should be relatively equal and you should be pretty smooth in both directions. So if you notice that you're able to roll in, but not necessarily out, that gives you a key piece of information that you're not able to get that rear of your heel, your ankle to be able to roll outwards. Um, and so over time, that can actually redistribute the way your foot is absorbing force and maybe even the way that you're squatting or lunging or the way you're doing your lifts. And so that can obviously affect the rest of uh, your movement patterns. 
The next one after we look at how our toes, how's our ankle moving, is how is the shin? Um, it's not really something you think about, but if the shin isn't really moving well, then you're not gonna be able to get into kind of like this deep ankle flexion. Um, often when I try to work on ankle mobility with a lot of basketball players, we eventually aren't able to get the ankle to dorsiflex or get like up toward the shin very well like this. And they're like, they still can't really squat. And a lot of times it's because the shin is kind of locked into this external rotation. Um, so the best way that I can kind of demonstrate this is if you put your foot on the ground, you lift your foot up, so you're flexing the foot, now keeping the heel on the ground, I want you to rotate the foot to the outside and then rotate the foot to the inside, keeping the foot flexed. And so if you put your hand over this little bump right here, the first bump on your shin, you should feel your shin rotate under your fingertips. And so that feeling should be relatively the same in both directions. So if you are locked into one particular position, you might find that you have an inability in particular basketball players to rotate this internally, uh, which is a key part of getting enough ankle dorsiflexion um, to get into like a deep squat or get the knees over the toes safely. The next part's our hip. So there's a lot, there's a lot more to it, but in probably the simplest way that I can show you is we'll keep the hip here in this, where the knees lined up with the hip, and you're gonna just lift up a little bit off the ground so you do this off a chair and i want you to internal and externally rotate the hip so what that means is you're going to bring the heel toward the inside of your body or toward the other leg this is external rotation as i bring the heel to the outside of my body this is internal rotation occurring at the hip so i want you to think about keeping the knee in line with the hip here and i want you to see can you externally rotate and how much do you have if you come back, how much internal rotation do you have? And then assessing that compared to the other side, and again, you can kind of just eyeball it. Coming back around. And so if you come into internal external rotation, and you notice you have way more motion on one side. Um, let's say I have more external rotation on one side and very little on the other. Um, that gives you a key piece of information that lets you know, hey, one hip is doing a little bit better than the other when it, as it comes to external rotation or maybe internal rotation. So these are all things that are important in terms of assessing and then kind of figuring out where do you go from there. Um, because otherwise, you, when you think about a lot of the weight room lifts that people do, it often locks us into this bilateral positioning. And what happens when you do that is, you're now demanding that both hips, both knees, both ankles are doing the same motion. But as I just mentioned, if you have one hip that can do a little bit more external rotation than the other, then how can you expect that to happen under load uh, symmetrically, uh, let's say like in a squat, right? So if the hips aren't moving equally, then that's something that you wanna address and you want to uh, kind of work on to shore up that issue because that can kind of manifest in the back uh, if you're not getting, let's say, for example, enough hip extension on one glute versus the other, um, and so it's not moving kind of evenly um, during your lifts or even while you're running, so that can um, show up as like kind of lower back fatigue or soreness. So the last thing here is called a CAR. It stands for Controlled Articular Rotation. And what I want to see is can you move your hip independent of your lower back? Uh, because you don't have interdependence until you have independence, okay? Uh, the main thing when you do this for the hip is that you want to hold on to something because we're trying to assess your hip mobility and not necessarily your balance, right? Make sense? So we're gonna hold on to the rack, maybe hold on to a chair or doorway. From here, you're gonna go into position one, which is hip flexion, drive the knee up toward the chest. So drive it up as high as you can without kind of leaning back or shifting too much. From here, I want you to open up, show me the inside of your thigh, going as far out as you can to AB duction. From here, you're gonna internally rotate or heel up toward the ceiling. And from there, you're gonna wrap around into extension, squeezing the glute a little bit. From there, you're gonna open back up. I like to say, I wish I had a better analogy, but this works with all my clients. Think about a dog urinating on a tree. From there, you're gonna externally rotate or bring the heel back toward the front. 
from there you're going to wrap it back around. So from the side, to kind of talk you through a few points that you might be feeling. Uh, one is, if you go into flexion, you can't maintain that height. That's an important finding. Uh, probably more significant to more people is, if I open up here and I try to rotate, you might actually get little to no motion. You might get a pinching sensation, which is a closing angle joint pain. And what that usually tells you is that, that there's a capsular issue likely on the opposite side that's kind of restricting you from moving and causing you to get that pinching sensation. It doesn't mean that you want to go foam roll or get a massage gun and kind of just work that area because it's not going to help. So as we get to here and we rotate, if we end up kind of dumping forward, that tells us that we are limited in internal rotation at that particular area in that section of the car. And that's something that we want to expand and open up. The other thing is, as you're coming into extension and coming back around here, that you don't want to not be able to feel it. Meaning, if I can't get into good extension here, that means that when I'm squatting and deadlifting and doing lunges, I'm probably not getting there either, right? Or even when I'm on the court running. And so for those that often complain, my back hurts after I'm playing, there's a good chance that you're just not getting good hip extension during your, the gait cycle, right? So if I, you think about like a deadlift, right? And I'm finishing the motion. If I'm coming up all the way and I finish here and say, I'm tall, right? This is all this extension is coming from here to finish the motion versus squeezing the glutes and pushing the hips forward, right? Not hyperextending, but just getting good terminal hip extension. Um, and so that kind of, kind of cues you into what what could be causing some of these issues either up or down the body. So that concludes this little self-assessment that you can do to try to figure out why things are bugging you so much. Um, and at least begin the process as to understanding why something's a problem and how to kind of rectify that so that you can get back out on the court. Um, if you found anything interesting, leave a like. If you have any questions or if you'd like me to do a follow-up video, sort of addressing some of these issues. I'd be more than happy to do it if there's enough interest, uh, in particular in the comments, um, as to addressing why I have this pinching sensation or why I can't squat, um, why my back hurts after I run a few games, right? Um, so these are things I'd be more than happy to address if there's enough interest. Um, otherwise, uh, I will catch you next time and hopefully a lot of this information was helpful or useful to you. All right, take care.